Okay, so for everyone that's here, welcome. For everyone that's yet to come, welcome when you get here. Uh, we've got Mark Headley, Lead Engineer uh, Temporary Works for Down in New Zealand, who's a presenter, and Stacey Golds, who are the Technical Manager for CCNZ, uh, and myself, Fraser May, Communications Advisor for Civil Contractors New Zealand. So uh, I'm going to just introduce you briefly, have already uh, Mark Headley and Stacey Goldsworthy, and then I'm going to hand over to Stacey, who's going to take us for the first part of this presentation. Um, so go right ahead, Stacey. Uh, thanks, Fraser. So um, just probably just to kick off here, just uh, discuss uh, industry self-governance and how uh, industry over time, when it sees a, um, a niche or a gap, and how we are governed that isn't covered by one of the regulators or isn't covered by specification we get together as a um, as a collective and we start to look at uh, what is required um, and then form some guidance or some documentation around that so typically um, where we have done this in the past uh, industry uh, collaborates with those that have a particular skill set niche um, experience knowledge whatever it may be in a particular area around either operations um, or in the technical arena and then from that we uh, we get together and define what good good practice these days it's not best practice uh, what that actually should look like and that's normally involves some pretty robust discussion once um once we've got to that point where we we agree on what it looks like um, if there's any unsafe practice that, help, that happens out there uh, we look to uh, work with the industry uh, to improve what we do and that may be through engineering controls and there's the, the uh, risk management there's the hierarchy controls typically we look at um, engineering um, or uh, administrative or PPE the the eliminate is probably a little bit more difficult to for us as a industry to to, to undertake so we're um, if we have practice that doesn't conform with um, act or regulations um, or existing approved code, uh, codes of practice, uh, we engage with stakeholders, normally that regulatory, uh, to, to ensure that we are compliant, and that may uh, that requires our, us outlining what uh, where we are not non-compliant, and then if if we can uh, look at how we we change that. And I'll talk around one of the documents that we. Um, we issue at the moment and how we've worked with WorkSafe around uh, getting uh, outside the um, the current regulations. So once uh, once we have got some documentation uh, together, um, got some uh, a system and a process around sort of health governance, we then look at um, getting that uh, recognised by clients. Um, typically, because we've found an area that needs to be addressed, we've raised it with clients. Um, and then it's a matter of uh, either putting that into one of their specifications, so they point to our documentation, or it comes in as a as a contract specific requirement. So this allows clients to have confidence that um, the industry uh, will deliver on on our expectations, and also that we have uh, the systems and processes to have, and then be able to demonstrate that um, that we are are conforming. So, Fraser, can we flip to the next slide? If we get you to do that. So one of the examples that we have of this is widely um, required from all the um, road control authorities, the, um, the RCAs is BPGA1. So this was updated uh, and put out maybe nine months ago. So it's the old Road New Zealand uh, 9805 document. So um, CCNZ pulled together various working parties that looked at the operational, um, the technical design and the electrical requirements and uh, update them to reflect what is the current act uh, around the electricity act um, and hazardous substance regulations which come out of the health and safety of work act and plus there were some other ones in there as well that uh, we learned along the way uh, we did uh, rationalize the document to a degree but as we went through it uh, found that it was deficient in some areas so we uh, we've included uh, more work around terminals and um, ship to shore uh, bitumen transfers. So that document is uh, is now online, and um, as we do updates, you know, we do small updates now as opposed to when it was a paper copy, we had to do more larger ones. Um, and these can be done at any time, and um, all those changes pushed out to those that um, that subscribe to it. So just talking around that document, um, we've got uh, the uh, the industry is governed by the uh, dangerous goods. Uh, regulate well land transport rules and um, how, how they work but as also as part of this process we engage with WorkSafe 
and um, they have uh, the hazardous substance uh, regulations which came out in December 2017. So the industry wasn't uh, is in compliant with the um, hazardous substance regulations um, and that was mainly due to them applying more to uh, petrol and diesel and, and that kind of product um, that's carted in tank wagons. So we've worked with uh, WorkSafe to establish a safe work instrument, agreed the uh, criteria where we are non-compliant and uh, agreed some alternative. So we're just working with them to get that completed and get that uh, pushed out to uh, out, out to industry. So yeah. that concludes my bit. Yeah, uh, great. Well, no, th thanks for that, Stacey. It's really good just to have a little bit of an intro about uh, in industry self-governance and also uh, that example. And now Mark has the lion's share of the presentation. So uh, I'll hand over to you, Mark, and please take uh, take it away on your your segment there. Thanks, uh, Fraser and Stacey, uh, and good afternoon. <clears throat> I'm speaking on behalf of the Temporary Works Forum New Zealand, and today I'd like to present to you the case for having a good practice guideline. And I'd like to thank CCNZ for the opportunity to present here today, and I hope everyone finds this talk helpful. So in this presentation, what we're gonna do, as it says on the screen here, I'm gonna introduce you to the Temporary Works Forum because many of you will not have heard of us before, who we are and what our objectives are. We're gonna look at three historical events as I present a case for having a good practice guideline. I'll introduce that document and then finally present a worked example to show you how to use it. So who is the Temporary Works Forum and what's our purpose? Well, we're a, we are made up of temporary works engineers who are really passionate about what we do. We work for a number of construction companies and civil consultancies, engineering consultancies. And we started this forum after one of Brendan Atterwell's courses, Temporary Works Risks and Awareness, run through Engineering New Zealand. And some of you may have attended one of those courses. Um, and while I'm mentioning Brendan, uh, I want to acknowledge that he chaired the Temporary Works Forum for the first two years and made the major contribution to writing the Good Practice Guide, which I'm going to talk about today. So this is where we sit organisationally. Uh, Engineering New Zealand is the professional body of engineers, and under that we have the technical group CSOC, the Structural Engineers Society, and we sit in there as a special chapter of CSOC. We're mainly structural engineers, really. And so our main purpose is to encourage open discussion on any matter related to temporary works for the benefit of New Zealand and the construction industry. That's our purpose. So in line with those objectives, we have produced this document that I would like to commend to you today. Temporary Works Procedural Control, Good Practice Guideline. Now, it's not a book that tells you what load factors to use and the design methods of temporary works. It's more a book about the process, how to be thorough and how to document that thorough process. And we, as a Temporary Works Forum, are hopeful that this guide will gain acceptance by contractors in New Zealand, large, medium and small. And that's, our, that's what we're hoping we will achieve today. Some people, particularly smaller contractors, may feel the last thing they need is more red tape, more paperwork and more cost on their jobs. I believe I understand where you're coming from. So what I'd like to do today is present to you a case of why I think this is a good idea for you, and then go on to show how easily it can be applied on a typical construction job. So I'm particularly reaching out to the small to medium civil contractors today. So let's have a look at three historical examples. This is a picture of the Civic Theatre building in central Auckland. And we're going to watch a short three minute movie clip of the, being, of the building being built around 90 years ago. So if you can have a look at uh, get that movie going, uh, Fraser. The first reason 
for having a good practice guide is that how we did it in the past is not acceptable today. Here we go. With Only the, the world's best, however, had to be up and running in 33 weeks. He needed to cash in on the Christmas holidays. Excavation began even before architectural plans were completed. When the building inspector came on site, he was unceremoniously doused in cement. Thus began the heroic period of what must be regarded as Auckland's version of the building of the pyramids. And a young man, Jim Manley, borrowed a camera and came down every lunch hour to film. But if speed was of the essence, danger was the rule. My name is Harold Dawson and these are my experiences on the Civic Theatre when I joined the construction gang. I was apprentice, just finished my time, age 21. When the uh, job started, there was a big rush of fellas for jobs, you know, and they used to wait on the curb out in Wellesley Street and somebody gets sacked, another one would be taken in. But every day the ambulance used to come along and pick up somebody that got clobbered and if nobody had been killed, the police would go away again. The walls were about 27 inches thick and there was about four or five courses of bricks. And what they used to do, they used to lay the inner and outer row, and then they'd just get bricks in each hand and dump them in like that. And then they'd get buckets of mortar and slosh them along with buckets of water, and then they'd trail it all in. And by this time, the blacks at the other end had got next lot up, see? If you couldn't do your 3,000 bricks a day, you couldn't keep your job. Well, <clears throat> it's very easy to see what was wrong with that construction site when you've got 90 years of contrast there. But the point I'm really making here is what about the last 10 to 20 years? Are there things that we've been doing for a while that are in need of some change or some review? Because how we did it in the past is not acceptable today. The, um, this is a picture here of the DIC building in Wellington and the collapse of the veranda in 1957. And the second reason for having a good practice guide is that there are advantages in self-regulation, as Stacey was pointing out at the beginning. And the most obvious is we get to decide how to do our own work. And if the industry doesn't regulate itself properly, then central government may step in and regulate the industry. And this is what happened back in 1957. So this picture of the DIC building was on the cover of the little booklet that I got from a Department of Labor training course back in the 1980s. And what happened here was that the scaffolding was being dismantled. They had uh, completed the work on the building and they were dismantling the scaffold and stockpiling the materials on the veranda that overhangs the footpath. It was intended then to pass the materials on down and load them onto a truck and take them away. But the veranda became overloaded by the stockpile of materials and it collapsed onto the footpath below and two people were killed. As a result of this, the government of the day, they had an inquiry and the Construction Act 1959 came into law. And as we know, the Department of Labor administered that act. 
Then later on, we had 1992, we had the, Self, the Health and Safety Act 1992, and, and OSH administered that act. And of course, more recently, the Health and Safety Act uh, 2015, after the um, Pike River Mine disaster, now, of course, WorkSafe are administering that act. Now, just to be clear, I'm not saying these government departments and these government initiatives are bad. I'm not saying that at all. They're doing a good job and they're doing it well. It's just that when you have to uphold the law and an act of parliament, it's very hard to keep things lean and simple. Self-regulation, on the other hand, can be a lot more nimble and a, not, and a lot more responsive to new ideas and to changes. The third and final case for a good practice guide is this example, Ramp A. So very briefly, Ramp A was a post-tensioned concrete box girder bridge span that was part of Auckland's original Central Motorway Junction or Spaghetti Junction as it was called. And just in case someone does want to ask the question who the contractor was, the contractor was Downer and Company. But anyway, this is a very important temporary works event. And if there was interest out there, um, I think it'd be worth having a session on this one failure alone. I know that there are many eminently qualified engineers out there with first-hand knowledge, and some of whom I've spoken to recently. So thank you to those who I have contacted and have sent the information, I appreciate it. Anyway, the span was supported on scaffold false work. And during the post-tensioning process, the span began, began to arch in the middle, transferring the load from the scaffolding and to the scaffolding at the ends. To make matters worse, at one end, some of the scaffolding was founded on firm ground and some found it on fill, which settled. This meant that the scaffolds at that end be became grossly overloaded and buckled, and that led to the progressive collapse. Well, fortunately, by God's grace, all of this happened at lunchtime while the workers were away in the sheds, so nobody was hurt. And although pre-stressed pre concrete wasn't brand new, at the time, these were amongst the early years. One of the disappointing things about this event is that an almost identical bridge span had been built in Wellington on the Shell Gully project by Wilkins and Davies. And they had experienced similar problems, but they managed to shore up in time. And at the time of this event, it was said if only they'd let us know they'd had a problem, we could have told them. So, if there had been strong links to a body like the Temporary Works Forum, where lessons learned and best practice were shared, maybe that could have avoided the incident. And we do know that there, there was not a good process because one of the outcomes of Ramp A was the Ministry of Works Code of Practice for False Work, 1980. Very good document, actually. So there we have three historic events that I think support a case for the Good Practice Guide. How we did it in the past is no longer okay. The advantages of self-regulation and Ramp A, where the lack of good progress, was, the lack of good process was at least partly to blame. So, what is this document and how will it change what I'm doing? I'm just going to highlight four key points and then I'm, we're going to see how they play out in a worked example. The first thing it does, it gives names to certain people and defines their roles so that all the tasks are divided up and nothing slips through the cracks. 
it contains guidance on choosing the risk category. And we're going to talk a bit more about that later on. It contains all the forms and templates that you need, and you can brand these and personalize them and so forth. And it explains the steps of design, checking, inspection, permit to load, etc. We're familiar with all of that. Now, the guide covers a lot more than these four points. I'm just highlighting some that I think are relevant to you today. And as, you, as I say, you may already be doing a lot of this. Well done. But if you think some of this seems new to you, I'm just going to take you through a little worked example. How does it work? Here's a little job that might be done by a small to medium civil, uh, medium sized civil contractor. This picture shows a, uh, whoops, we're going too fast there. Right, this picture shows a sheet piled excavation and we need to dig a hole to put in a manhole. And that's the sheet piling there, you see, going down, forming a box. And there's a whaler there, a whaler around the, the top because it's a deep one, and there's the excavator there. So here's the object of this example is to show you how easily you can do this job in the context of the good practice guideline. And I'm going to, whoops, I'm going to highlight three main things, the people involved, the risk category, and the temporary works register. So firstly, the people involved. If we're going to adopt the good practice guideline for our work, there will need to be a person called the designated individual. He's the person that's ultimately responsible for having temporary works done properly. So that could be the company director in this case. He would appoint someone called a temporary works coordinator. And in this little example, that could be our site engineer. Let's say she is a BE plus a Bachelor of Engineering plus three years experience. She could be the temporary works coordinator. The other person that he would appoint is the temporary works supervisor. And that could quite naturally be our site supervisor. And let's just say he's got 30 years experience in this sort of work. He's the temporary works supervisor. So the designated individual has delegated the work to his temporary works coordinator and the temporary works coordinator now has to get a designer and a checker for the temporary works. Well, in this little example, our temporary works coordinator could have two roles. She could be the designer as well. She's been doing this work for three years. She's been under the coaching and mentoring and direct and uh, uh, instruction of her manager. She knows how to do it. She can be the designer. And the company director, he could be the checker. So what I'm pointing out here is that this little, this little company can follow the good practice guide with a relatively small team of people, not having to go out and employ a whole lot of new specialised staff. So that's the people involved. Now, assessing the risks. I like to think that as engineers, we've always been doing risk assessment. It's part of every good designer's daily work. The only thing is that as engineers, we don't tend to document this very well. Well, the good practice guide gives guidance on how to assess the risk and choose the category. And the, the first thing we consider is the consequences of failure. Now, on the DIC building that we looked at earlier, the consequences of failure are quite catastrophic and in that case, fatal. In our little sheet pile box here, the failure might be bending of the sheets perhaps and settlement of the ground and not quite as critical. The second thing we look at is design complexity. 
If we're de dealing with a structure that has a lot of different uh, forms of support and it's got quite a complicated load path and the loads are quite high, then that risk is high. In our little sheep pile excavation here, um, it's fairly straightforward. So we're on the lower side. And the final thing we assess when we do the risk category is the execution criticality. If we've got a structure that has lots of joints and lots of members and a lot of site welding and so forth, then the execution criticality might be higher. But for our little job here, it's on the lower side. And if we went to our good practice guideline, Appendix E, we would choose category one. The categories go from zero, one, two, three. Zero being the lowest, and three being the most critical, the, the highest risk. And then finally, the register. Now, this the register is a document that can really help you, and this is another job for our temporary works coordinator. I've taken this example here from the from the good practice guide and uh, I've abbreviated it a little bit. So what our temporary works coordinator does is they put in the, the um, job, they write down the names of the temporary works coordinator and the temporary works supervisor. In this case, it's going to be Jill and Gus. We put in the the check category that we've already worked out, it's category one. Jill's gonna be the designer and Bob's gonna be the checker. And so we just simply work from left to right. The box is filled, we've done it. The box is empty, that's the next thing to do. So Jill will do the design and sign a design certificate. And when she's done that and dated it, she'll put the date in that box, just like this. There we go. And then when Bob has done his, his check and signed his check certificate, the date goes in that box. And if there's a permit to load or a permit to unload, then the dates go in there. Now, I've just given you the brief version here in this webinar, but this example is written out in a lot more detail as a one pager that's available online. And there are two other examples there and you can download these from our website and they will give you guidance on how to use the Good Practice Guide. So how do you access the website? Well, that's pretty easy. We'll just go to that uh, video, please, Fraser, of walking through the website. So this is um, this is our website. You Google Temporary Works Forum New Zealand and click on the link and that'll take you to the CSOC web page. And you'll see up here that we are a special chapter of CSOC, the Temporary Works Forum. So if we scroll on down, we have our aims and objectives all written down here. And, and we've been through those already. Over on the right, you'll see there's temporary works training. This is a link to the next courses that are available that are being taken by Brenda Atwell, temporary works risks and awareness. And it'll, you click on that, it'll give you the next um, course that's available in your area. Scrolling on down through the web page, we see that there are contact details. If you want to leave us a message, for example, there's a uh, email address there. And there are the committee members, uh, Gil Johnson from Fulton Hogan is the current chair, and there's all the rest of the committee members. Over on the right, you'll see links to the Temporary Works Forum UK Temporary Works Forum Hong Kong, they have useful documents. 
Then scrolling on down, we have the publications that we've got available to download. First of all, the Good Practice Guideline, which I've been talking about today, you can download it there. And the example that we've just been through in just a bit more detail, and two other examples that we've got there of um, how to use the Good Practice Guide. We've got some information posters here. Now, these are uh, more to raise awareness that these are things that need to be done properly. So they're fairly brief. Um, there's links to New Zealand publications here and links to some international publications, which are useful. So, um, so yeah, that's the website. Temporary Works Forum. Very good, okay. I'll just come back again. Yeah, thanks for that, Mark. And so, um, we've proposal. just um, put, uh, sorry about that, Mark. we've just put um, a link to the website in the chat function. So if anyone wants to ride that link through the Temporary Works Forum website, they're welcome to do so now. Um, or at a later date. Great, uh, please go ahead. Thank you for that. Just to close the presentation, how can you get involved? If you want to, you can join one of our working groups. Now, this is a picture of one of the working groups that met together after one of our public meetings. We've had four public meetings around the country, in Auckland, Wellington, and Christchurch. And there's another public meeting coming up in Christchurch. We've had to postpone it a couple of times due to COVID, but we will be rescheduling that one. Um, so we've got four working groups working on hot topics such as steel frame methodologies, that's the group shown here in the picture, scaffold structures, um, crane platforms, formwork and false work. And our aim is to produce technical guidance notes for these subjects and make them freely available to the industry. There aren't any finished yet, but one or two are getting fairly close. Another thing you could do is join the committee. We will have uh, vacancies on the committee coming up in 2021 and 2022. And we're keen to see people who are committed and passionate to temporary works coming on board. And finally, if you're doing something really well and you're willing to share your temporary works knowledge with the industry, we could help you to form a working group and give you a format for writing a technical guidance note, get you into a group, and that could be reviewed and published through the Temporary Works Forum. So that's the case that I have for the Good Practice Guide. I'm hoping to get feedback from particularly small to medium civil contractors. We already do have a lot of backing from major civils, but for the small to medium people, um, I think it will help you. Uh, it's free, and I hope I've shown you it's not too difficult to apply. Thanks, Fraser. Excellent. Well, thanks so much for your time today, Mark. It's uh, really uh, interesting looking at those examples, and also uh, thank you so much for sharing your knowledge and uh, taking everyone through that uh, worked example as well. So uh, we've got about uh, maybe up to 10 minutes here if we want to go through a few different questions. Uh, hoping Stacey's still with us. You're still there, Stacey? Yes, I am. Uh, yep, great. Okay. So um, I guess what, one question that came through was around um, Temporary Works Forum. And um, I, I suppose one way to uh, that uh, was funded, uh, I guess, would you be able to uh, answer that, Mark? Or I, I think my, well, the best way to answer that might be talking about how it was founded. How, how did Temporary, Temporary Works Forum come about? Yes, um, <clears throat> we got together after one of Brendan Atterwell's courses that he held in Christchurch two and a half years ago. And we decided there that it would be a good idea to have a forum that could speak for New Zealand temporary works and a good practice guide that could um, show good process for, for temporary works in New Zealand. We're not, we're, we're being um, loaned to the temporary works forum by our parent companies. We don't have any money. Um, we don't do anything of, um, that costs money really. 
So we are dependent on sponsors and uh, and the like. So that's mm. how we're funded. Right. So resourced by the industry and working for the industry. So that's a, that's a good way to look at it. Yeah, great. Um, okay. So another question uh, was around um, the examples there. So uh, what, what are the other lessons that, I mean, the ramp pay, you mentioned that um, that was an example of a particular interest. Um, did you get any many other lessons from that particular particular one? Look, um, I don't really, I'm not really the person to speak more about ramp A. Mm. Um, apologies if you thought that the um, presentation was going to be all about ramp A. I know it was a, a captivating picture and all, and it clearly got people interested. But the thing there with ramp A is if, if there was interest out there, let us know. And I'm sure we could find people who had firsthand knowledge of investigating and, and reporting on it and we could learn a lot more, I'm sure. And I think that would be a good thing to do. Mm. Right, a uh, question from uh, Jonathan here. Does the practice guide uh, include advice on how to ma effectively manage the temporary works and permanent works interface? Hmm, not sure about that. Um, it's one that you have to be careful about, temporary works, permanent works interface. Um, I, I don't know, you have to be a bit more specific with the question perhaps. Yeah, exactly. And, and perhaps that's the sort of thing that, uh, you know, if it, uh, have a look at the guide and then, um, you know, I think if you, if, the, if it needs more work, then it's the sort of thing that um, Temporary Works Forum could um, could use a contribution on. Does it sound right, Mike? Yeah. Yep, right. that's, that's good. Get in touch directly with their website. I think that's a good way to go about it. Um, yeah, another specific question that's come through is uh, around the risk of earthquakes and managing the risk of earthquake, earthquakes with false work like the one shown in the picture. And if there's any way to design that into the false work. Now, that's quite a specific question. So is that one you want to address, Mark, or is that uh, a little bit outside of the scope of yeah. the guideline? My, my recommendation for um, seismic uh, design for temporary works is that people use 1170, there's a um, return period there for uh, um, temporary works and construction, and you can work out a, um, a seismic load from 1170 that's appropriate for temporary works. Hmm, great. Yeah, okay. And uh... I think you know you made a pretty good case for for uh, temp for, for the good practice guideline there in terms of like a, a industry sharing knowledge within industry and then everyone learning from that. Uh, you know, uh, did you have any did you have any thoughts on that, Stacey? That sort of things. Uh, the need for a good practice guideline. Oh, always good to have guidance out there that people can make reference to. Um, you know, it's, it starts to promote uh, good practice. Um, best practice and generally safe practice um, having endorsement by clients is um, makes it mandatory or can make it mandatory and then from that you get a level playing field for everybody to tender and therefore you get that implemented mm. okay yeah sounds good okay so um I think well, someone's just commented about the earthquakes point. Um, so jump off if, if it starts to shake is not the answer. And that's good. <laughs> <laughs> that's a nice comment by the end of the day. Yeah, so, um, oh, so did you... No, I just wanted to make another comment if I could about the public meetings, mm. um, because the public meeting in Christchurch we've postponed a couple of times. Um, we, are, we are planning to do it as a physical meeting. We're not planning to do these online. And part of the reason for that is we value the, um, the networking opportunity. We think that's good for people to get together. So we're not doing them as, a, as an online thing. And also we want to make this a place where lessons learned can be shared. And some of these subjects get pretty sensitive. So um, if we do this as a webinar uh, or online, then I think we're going to be less likely to get some open sharing. Whereas if it's all in a room and contain a contained environment and Chatham House rules apply, I think there'll be a safer place where we'll get um, 
lessons learned shared more openly. Hmm. Excellent. Okay, so we've got the website um, addresses there uh, on the on this page. So feel free to visit either uh, the TWF or search them out. Definitely take a look. Uh, we're very supportive of um, Temporary Works Forum, the good work you're you know, the team are doing there, Mark. Um, did you have any final points to add, Stacey and Mark? Maybe Stacey first, and then um, we might wrap for the day. Uh, no, not from me. Okay, any final points to add there, Mark? Uh, no, I think that's about it for me. Thank you uh, very much for the opportunity, and I hope everyone enjoyed it. Not a problem. Well, well thanks very much once again from, from CCNZ and from the audience for taking the time to present. And um, for everyone that joined us, we'll make this webinar av recording available to you. So if you missed the start of it or something along those lines, or if you want to share it, please feel free to do so. And um, again, don't hesitate to get in touch with us directly if uh, you've got any feedback or uh, would like any further action from us. And um, Otherwise, I wish you all a good afternoon and uh, thanks very much for your time and uh, your effort on this one, Mark. And thanks for your time, Stacey. Cheers, guys. See you later. Good afternoon. Goodbye.